Bruce Stillings, Big Game Supervisor, North Dakota Game and Fish Department. We started the project in 2019, but to just give a little bit of background leading into that. Um, so we had elk in the Kildare Mountain area since 1977. We had our first hunting season in that area in E2 in 1984. And then in 1985, the south unit of Theodore Roosevelt National Park translocated 47 elk to their south unit of the park. And the elk did really well and numbers expanded and grew. And by 1997, we were able to hold a limited August season to address agricultural depredation and also to provide our hunters some opportunities. And so from 1997 through about 2010, we'd have these limited seasons, uh, late summer, um, early fall. They did get extended on as years went by, but the gist was elk would get outside of the park, um, address agricultural crop depredation, provide our hunters opportunities. But at the end of the day, those elk would always return to the park for the winter. And that all changed starting in about 2010. The south unit of the park completed an environmental impact statement to re-address their population objectives of elk inside the park. And in 2010 and 2011, approximately 900 elk were culled using qualified volunteers and team leaders to reduce that elk population. So once elk were hunted, harvested, disturbed inside the park during those events, many of those elk dispersed both north of the park and south of the park. And that's when we started seeing small herds started to establish after 2011. So then once we saw that elk are gonna be a long-term component in the Western Badlands, we knew that there was information that we needed, um, elk movements, home ranges, uh, resource selection, what type of habitats are they using, their survival rates, and then also to develop a population monitoring program. We partnered with the University of Montana, Dr. Josh Millspa, that's a uh, lead big game researcher in the country, and working with one of his grad students, Dan Marina, and so the project is uh, yeah, being conducted through the University of Montana with funding from the Boone and Crockett Club and the North Dakota Game and Fish Department. So putting all those pieces together um, has allowed this project to be completed. So we captured and collared 149 elk starting in 2019. Uh, mostly were marked on cows, but we did get a, a fairly good sample on yearling bulls and even some of those younger sub-adult bulls. Uh, they were equipped with GPS collars that collect a location every two hours. So in the course of this study, our graduate student Dan Marina is working with just under 1.1 million elk locations when he's completing his analyses. The analyses are done. We've just, just finished up earlier last month with the final report and the project ha has been completed. A lot of good information came out of this project related to elk management. Uh, you know, the first, first big one would be that we established that we determined we have nine distinct herds in the western part of the state, including the park. And these herds overlap very, very little. Um, so yeah, that's really key for management that now we can define those areas when we have issues with uh, too many elk within a particular herd. We can do targeted harvest approaches with private landowners to address those areas where they might be exceeding landowner tolerance. You know, just some of the, you know, general movement information. Uh, uh, for instance, an average home range of a cow elk is about 50 square miles or a township and a half. Uh, bulls are using a little bit larger area, about 70 square mile, miles on average. So just about uh, two townships. Um, on any average day, from the you know, GPS collars to collecting a location every two hours on, on just an average day, elk are moving between two and three miles a day. 
Um, so yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's really good information on movements, home range. Um, our elk are non-migratory. They're using much of the same seasonal range year round with a lot of overlap. Although they're non-migratory, we did identify some really uh, noteworthy dispersal movements from young bulls. Uh, we had bulls that dispersed uh, permanently uh, into eastern Montana. Uh, one of the most, no most notable movements that we documented was from a yearling bull up in that Blue Buttes area. And he dispersed, um, yeah, made well, a straight line distance. He, it was about 150 mile movement down to the Slim Buttes area uh, near Riva, South Dakota. But that 150 mile movement he made, he, he actually took about a 550 mile path to, to get there. He crossed Lake Sakakawea multiple times. He crossed the Missouri River. He went by some existing elk herds that we have down south of uh, Bismarck in the Porcupine Hills, continued south into, into South Dakota, and then made a, a big west-west uh, turn until he found that Slim Buttes area um, that already has a, an elk population in South Dakota. And, and so once he, he found that, he had a very small home range, um, used much of the, the Forest Service land in that area. And so he, he resided in that area until, until the collar fell off. So it was about a 122 day uh, trek that he took to, to make that movement. Elk are doing really, really well. Their, their numbers have been increasing the last 10 years. Um, we've been, yeah, you know, working with, you know, what can be supported within the habitat, but then what's tolerable with area uh, ranchers. So we've been, yeah, working closely on, on this issue and increasing licenses as the population has grown. And we've started to see that with these increased antlerless licenses that that population growth has started to slow and more now is stabilizing. Now that doesn't mean each herd is stabilizing or maybe decreasing, but herds that, that private landowners, game and fish have been working closely together with some of the tools we have with the, the early antlerless season, uh, the 1260 uh, antlerless uh, depredation licenses for landowners um, increased access for the lottery hunters. We have seen those increased number of cow licenses relating to decreased elk numbers in those herds. The Badlands have been great elk habitat from, from day one. If, if you go even farther back in the, in the history, um, there was elk that were brought in by a local group to the Kildare Mountains in 1942. Um, elk were translocated from Yellowstone National Park and, and they did, did really well, um, numbers increased, uh, but yeah, there were some conflicts with agricultural lands, hay lands, um, and so it just wasn't a, a compatible fit at, at that time. Um, the park elk that was studied, you know, from 1985, um, you know, up through the early 2000s, was looked at one of the most productive elk populations in North America. So the habitat in Western North Dakota is very uh, conducive and, and suitable for, for good elk populations. Now with the resource selection analyses, um, yeah, based on, on other literature and, and what elk like, they wanna be, be away from disturbance. And that's exactly what we found with our elk. Uh, on average, they prefer to be at least a third of a mile out to about 1.6 miles away from an uh, improved or unimproved road. And they also prefer to be about 1.6 miles from a active oil well or a well that's currently actively being drilled. So they wanna be, yeah, at least 1.6 miles away, away from that disturbance. And again, this is based on over 1.1 million collared elk locations. And, and so really, really solid information. The main mortality with elk in Western North Dakota was hunter harvest related. Out of the 27 mortalities that we documented, 24 were related to hunting, uh, 22 legal harvest and two wounding loss. And so, yeah, hunter harvest and managing elk is 
uh, critically important for managing numbers in the western part of the state. The last portion of the project was to determine a population monitoring uh, program. And so it was twofold. One, we developed a statistical population reconstruction model, which takes into account our harvest information, um, our hunter effort, the age at harvest. So when hunters submit their lower jaws for aging, um, we're putting that right into this population model. And then also the total harvest from um, our harvest reports. And then we're combining that with information from our collared animals, the survival rates, how many at risk, how many are surviving. And so this model is able to produce a uh, strong population estimate. And it, yeah, showing uh, west wide, you know, right there about 2,000 elk. Um, you know, and there's varying degrees of, you know, increasing, decreasing within each one of those herds. And then the second part of the population monitoring program is the development of an aerial survey. So we found that elk are, you know, they're grouping up in the winter. Um, you got your large cow groups. Um, the bulls are pulled into some large uh, bachelor groups. And so based on the telemetry information, we we're able to define those core wintering areas and develop transects that would be flown after the season so it's essentially we're getting a, a quality count for each one of our elk herds in the western part of the state. And that information from the aerial survey is very, very similar to what the model is producing. So we've really produced a, a strong population monitoring program through this study. Understanding the, the movement patterns, how herds are, are uh, yeah, discrete, there, there's not a lot of overlap between each herd, um, kind of, you know, some of those uh, local somewhat myths that were out there that the, the Elkhorn herd, once the season finished, that those elk would move down into the Bell Lake area and, and, and spend time down there. Yeah, we clearly shown that with the collared animals that you have an Elkhorn herd that stays farther north and then the Bell Lake that's staying farther south even after the season's over. So yeah, just a, a tremendous amount of information for elk management. 60% of the elk that we collared inside the south unit of the park, 60% um, of those are using areas outside the park. Um, so that's, that's good news for our hunters, providing e extra opportunities. And it also good news for the, the park service that's maintaining a, a higher bull to cow ratio um, for viewing opportunities, well, that makes a lot of sense because those yearling bulls are, are dispersing out uh, different times of year and, and working into some of the outside herds and um, a lot of times being uh, taken advantage of and providing an opportunity for one of our hunters. At the end of the day in this project, this, the, the whole project was geared towards management related questions and understanding movements, identifying home ranges, establishing a population monitoring protocol that's gonna help us uh, with harvest recommendations each year. Yeah, it just comes down to all this information was directly for elk management in the western part of the state.